Good morning, everyone out there in uh, Facebook land and Zoom land and YouTube land and all the other platform lands. We're here today to talk about something that is both confusing and comforting at the same time. And that is, uh, how does God work out his intention for us? and his intentions for time and space and and humanity when there is so much uh, conniving and evil and sinister uh, treachery in the world. And how does God work in such a way so that he can save and redeem and bless humanity and sometimes entire people groups through one person's negative experience. Let's pray. Our Father, today we're all faced with uh, the conundrum of uh, confusing voices and messages that we receive. And we are tossed about and we often come to doubt ourselves. We doubt our circumstances. We doubt our purpose. We doubt you. And your voice comes to us through your word, through the experiences of your and through our own experience that you are the guiding hand in our lives and that your glory also works for our good. And now our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It is the story of Joseph, and we come to the 45th chapter. Joseph has been doing a little dance. He has been in Egypt for many, many years. He has organized the nation to prepare for famine and to live with famine, and then to succeed in the midst of famine and not to experience the pangs of famine. They're in it, but they have food to share with themselves, with each other, and with the world. Joseph took this trip to Egypt through a circuitous route. He was the object of the jealousy of his brothers who saw him as his father's favorite because he was and uh, resented him he was a dreamer of dreams and they resented that and they sought to kill him but uh, through the intervention of big brother uh, instead threw him in a pit sold him into slavery and Joseph found his way to the house of uh, the slaveholder, Potiphar, and he excelled. Joseph was a winner. Joseph was the kind of guy that always bloomed where he was planted. And he rose to power in the uh, house of Potiphar. But again, through treachery, he found himself in prison. But through faithfulness and ingenuity and creativity, and the hand, the providential hand of God, he then finds himself in Pharaoh's house with insight that only God could give him into where history was going to be going for the Egyptian people. And he is able to arrange uh, the government and the economy and the agricultural community in such a way that would benefit Pharaoh, the king but also would save the people and the people of the region from the pangs of famine. 
that same famine, uh, so many years later, Joseph is an older man, described as a father to Pharaoh, and he encounters a group of nomadic people who come to visit him as the governor of Egypt to secure food for their family and their servants and their community because they are in the wilderness, uh, nomadic and under the, the curse of the famine that has come onto the land. They need to buy food. And Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. He is aged, he is in all his regalia, and they do not recognize their little brother that they had so treacherously sold into slavery. Joseph tests their character through a series of events. They have a new little brother, Benjamin, who they dote upon who they uh, are protective of. They have learned a lesson apparently, and, and Joseph wants to know that, and he sees that their character has changed. And through all these interactions, we come to the 45th uh, chapter of Genesis. And in the first verse, it says, Joseph could control himself no longer and cries to everyone, everyone go out of the room, everyone leave, except these men and me. And just just really, um, at that point, Joseph makes himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, verse 2 says, so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph is my father still alive? But his brothers couldn't answer him. They were uh, dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Can you imagine this? This man who holds their lives, their fortunes, their destinies in his hand, this man who is so powerful in Egypt. He is the chief of all the civil servants. He is the head of the government. He, anything that, the, that he says, the king takes his advice. He has the power of life and death over him, them. And at that point, he says, I am your brother who you sold into slavery. And then the next words out of Joseph's mouth are, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. So at another point, Joseph says, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And the families, the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will neither be plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over the land of Egypt. Make haste, go up to my father, say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord over all of Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks, your herds and all that you have. And there I will provide for you. For there are yet five years of famine to come lest you and your household and all uh, that you have come to poverty. And now your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, and it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt and all that you've seen. Make haste and bring my father down here. 
and he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. That's when they entered into a conversation. We're not privy to that conversation. We haven't been told. Someone in that room reported all this. Oh my, look at the character of Joseph his ability to put the past behind, to see the hand of God, to see the intention of God in it all, and to believe that God's intention is what the most important thing is here, and the salvation of people, the redemption of people, the well-being of people, that somehow or another, the circumstances of our lives are incidental to the bigger picture. And how is it that God works these things out? I've created an acronym for intend. I give you the whole thing in one picture behind me, uh, which is uh, bad pedagogy, but it's really good uh, uh, ease of, of presentation. Uh, so here it is, the I for intend, if we look at what God intends. It is um, interventional. It's interventional. To learn to play, you know, you should take a sip of coffee or I don't smoke a pipe, but or a puff of a pipe or something when you talk about chess, right? It's very intellectual. Um, I didn't learn. I have to confess, I did not learn. But I learned from my grandfather early on how to play checkers. And I still play checkers, but now my opponent is a computer. And there are two things, well, really one thing, that I know and the computer knows. And that is there's more than one winning move in checkers. Checkers is not rigged so that there's just one winning move. And I'm told the chess is the same way. In fact, that's the way it is with so many games. I used to love to play Monopoly. You can uh, focus on winning Boardwalk and Park Place, or you can uh, start with Baltic Avenue and Mediterranean Avenue and, and buy up all the railroads and still win. There are different strategies to win. But God intervenes in all the strategies and all of the non-strategic moves of our lives. God intervenes in our lives and our circumstances, in our good decisions, in our bad decisions, in even the accidents of our lives to show us the next winning move. You might say in Joseph's life that the winning moves were that in whatever situation he was in, he relied upon uh, God, and he relied upon God's work within his own character to make the right decisions in the middle of those moves, so that even though they were really bad circumstances, even though they were, they looked like the other side was prevailing through the intervention of God, God's intention uh, came to pass. Uh, the redemption of the people, the uh, deliverance from starvation, the salvation of the people, the relationship with the Pharaoh that Joseph would not have met uh, in any other way. Well, I can't really say that, can I, in any other way? There were many ways. There were many moves that could have gotten Joseph there. These were the moves. And it started with Maybe Joseph, in his youth and joy of having a coat of many colors, uh, flaunting it, and his brothers resenting it, and doing something very treacherous and evil to their brother. But God meant something good to come of it and intervened at every step along the way, usually by prompting Joseph to do the right thing in the middle of it. Now, the end, the first end in intend, I'm making for narrative. 
I have shared the scripture with you as a story. That's how it was shared with me. That's how it's shared in the Bible. It's a story. Look at um, the book of Genesis. It's all one story, isn't it? Look at the book of Exodus. There's uh, some uh, didactic teaching. There's some dogma taught, but mostly in the form of story, of story. When Jesus lived and taught, he was living out a story and he taught stories. And it's not until you get really down to Paul. And of course, Luke records a story about Paul uh, in the book of Acts, a long story. But Paul enters into the stories of the churches that he writes to. He enters into their circumstances and tells the story. Even the book of Revelation is set in the form of a drama that is unfolding before us that has much deeper meaning than the circumstances. So the word narrative is important. God works in and speaks through the narratives of our lives. God gets into the middle of our story. That's why it's important for you to reflect upon the story of your life. To sing songs like, well, we've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. Uh, to understand that the hand of God was with you at every turn. That God was somehow with you. And by the way, can you survive this or that or the other? Well, if you've survived it, and if you're here listening to the sound of my voice, it is a good indication that you did survive things that you never thought you could survive. We learn that in the narrative of our lives. So Joseph even tells some of his story, fills in the blanks for his brothers. Because all they know is where they left off. They left Joseph in the pit. Uh, selling him to the tribe of marauders, the slave traders. And that's the last they heard of him. And that is not just that. The story goes on. Every time we part with someone, we part with them being a part of our story. And they are part of our story. And we are part of their story. And they go on and their story continues. And our story continues, and God is with both. The T is for transformative. What does God do with these narratives? What does God do with the circumstances of our lives? Well, he transforms them. But he transforms them and transcends them. That's really the word I use. He transcends them. He makes them more than they would be. He makes them more than they could be. He makes them more than we could ever imagine them being because he transcends and transforms and he does it through the meaning. He does it through their presence. He does it as we reflect upon them and he does them as we enter into partnership with him, that partnership which comes by faith and that comes when faith expresses itself in obedience. Even when Paul tells the story of the incarnation, he says in the book of Philippians, he emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant. Uh, he tells the story of, of Jesus uh, transcending uh, even his own divine existence by descending to earth and emptying himself and therefore god has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name that at the name of jesus every knee should bow things in the earth and under the earth and everywhere and every tongue confess that jesus is lord to the glory of god the father god is transcending and transforming and he is at work in your life desires for you to answer his call so that that transcendence might become complete in you. You are being changed. The meaning of your circumstances is being changed. Maybe the circumstances are not changing, 
but the meaning of those moments are changing. I say meaning of moment a lot because it's it's a key phrase in my life and in my theology. The meaning of our moments. Well, it's a transcendent kind of intervention in our narrative that uh, reflects upon and moves toward God's intention. By the way, uh, in the book of Romans, which is the uh, New Testament lesson for today, and uh, he talks about uh, God's intention for his people, uh, his special call people, the Israelites. And he, he asks the question, is, uh, has God abandoned his people? Uh, and he says, absolutely not. That the gifts and the calling of God are uh, without uh, without any kind of revocation. God doesn't take away what God gives. Uh, God has consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And it's like uh, Jesus uh Jesus kind of enters into this testing of people with the Canaanite woman when she comes and requests deliverance for her uh, daughter who is possessed by a demon. And he uh, messes with her a little bit. And he says, well, I've come to the last to just serve the sheep, uh, lost sheep of the house of Israel. And uh, it's not good to take uh, the food off the plate of the children and give it to the dog. She said, well, dogs eat scraps. And he says, woman, you've got great faith. Your daughter is healed. And here's another thing about God's intention. It comes out in Psalm 133, which is our psalm for the day. Uh, Behold how good and pleasant it is when uh, brothers uh, live together in unity. And what we're seeing here is an in, one of the aspects of God's intention in all of this encounter uh, of Joseph with his brothers. Uh, part of God's intention is that brothers come together and live in unity. Well, the E is for extraordinary. And uh, extraordinary is one of those words you say so fast that you forget what it means. And it, it is extra ordinary. So there's something out of the ordinary when we find meaning. It's not always what the world would recognize as miraculous, although sometimes it is. Who would think of a famine being addressed and the effects of famine being nullified because some kid uh, decades later had been sold into slavery. We don't know how long ago it was. You know, Joseph spent time in Potiphar's house. Joseph spent time in uh, the prison in Egypt. And now he's spent uh, at least seven years preparing the people for famine and two years uh, in the middle of famine addressing it. And it's pretty extraordinary, this story. This is one of the great extraordinary over a long period of time stories in the Bible, the story of how God works out his intention in the life of an heir who became a slave, who became an inmate, who became a governor. It's pretty impressive stuff. It's extraordinary. God has the power to do extraordinary things in our lives, extraordinary things that are extraordinary in the moment or you know they just show themselves wow that happened or over the long period that are only recognized as they're reflected upon well just as often as it is extraordinary it is also natural primarily even though god does the miraculous god does these amazing interventions most of what god does in our lives in our world takes place according to the laws of nature, according to his guiding hands in the normal circumstances of our life. You throw a ball up into the air, it's gonna come down somewhere. These uh, temporary idiots, you know, I'm not gonna call anybody an idiot. <laughs> at the, Jesus warned me about that. 
but uh, over a long period of time. But you know, we all have our idiotic moments who celebrate events by shooting guns into the air. And you wonder if the cloud, if they think the clouds are going to swallow those bullets so that they don't have to come down on the earth and land on something or someone. <laughs> the laws of nature are in effect. And it's almost always been true when I touch something really hot, I've been burned. And when I fall down, I feel it. And yet there, people will tell you that, it, Tom, as many times as you've fallen down and you've never sustained a major injury. I bumped my head so many times that you'd think that I couldn't put two words together uh, in any kind of cohesive way. And here I am talking to you, and I, I do sound like I'm in my right mind, do I not? And so providence has been here in the midst of all of the uh, natural things that have happened. And I look back and I think, why am I so blessed? Well, I want to go to the last word. And, and the last word is that is the word developmental. At first, I, I use the word dependent. And I, I thought that could be misunderstood to think that it's all about me or all about you in a way that is out of proportion. But in fact, God does call upon us to cooperate in all of this. And sometimes I think he intends to use us and we refuse. And so he'll use someone else. And that's kind of what Paul is talking about uh, in Romans 11. How uh, God will use anyone. He doesn't reject those that he's called, but he will sometimes use others to bring to pass what we refuse to work in the cooperation with. But what it really is about is development. God is developing character and spiritual power and insight into our lives and into our communities. God is developing us. Why are we not all that we uh, should be? Because uh, we're not there yet. But I have the desire to be there. Well, it's a path. It's a process. You don't flick your fingers and you're suddenly a spiritual or intellectual giant. Otherwise, I would have enrolled in kindergarten. I would have showed up for the first day of school. I would have been uh, implanted with all the knowledge that I would ever need for life. And then I would have gone about my business. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in the everyday world. It doesn't happen in the spiritual world. When Jesus calls you to follow him and offers you free grace and a clean slate, forgiveness of sin, the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, a new life, eternal life, free, it's all got to be worked out. We're working out that which is working within us. Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, not the fear and trembling that you're going to be lost, but the, the, the reverence of something holy and powerful is happening in your life every day. You, you, sometimes it's two steps forward and three steps back. And on the worst of days, it's three steps back and two steps forward, but over the long haul. It's one step after another that you're developing in grace, you're growing. And that, that was the prayer. That was the blessing that Paul kept offering. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you're at the front end of this call today. You're, you're just now realizing that God has an intent for your life. And he intends for you 
to be used as an instrument for his glory and the good of others. And that's the call. And you're realizing that uh, the cross settles the matter and that uh, what you've done in the past and what you've thought in the past and what you have intended in the past can be put in the past and that you can move forward by grace. And you just want to say yes to Jesus. And you, you're beginning that journey today of faith and you're trusting. Oh, I want to stand up and applaud. And I pray God's blessings on you. Communicate with us about that. Or maybe it's in the middle of your journey, or maybe it's the end of your journey, or it's just somewhere on your journey. And the truth is, until you come to the close of the, your earthly journey, you really never know exactly where you are in the journey, do you? Like the fellow said, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I would have taken a lot better care of myself. Well, you know what? The prayer is the same. Yes. Now, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart, I'll agree. And my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. And maybe that's the secret that Joseph learned. To say yes to God in every circumstance, to bloom wherever he was planted so that when the day would come, when he was united and reunited with his brothers, he wouldn't have to waste a moment in bitterness, in avarice, in hatred and regret, but to reunite with them and to reunite with his father and to save them from famine and all the people that had come after them, including one brother, uh, who uh, was Judah, who would become uh, the father uh, of the tribe of the Lion of Judah, through whom we would receive our King and Messiah and Savior and Lord Jesus. See, God's in this with us for the long haul. And with, when we become long haul thinkers, we plug into God's intent. And that becomes the great blessing of our life. And that becomes the thing that sustains us through the dungeons of life and through the injustices of life and through the pains of life. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.